In this video, we're going to discuss applications of exponential equations, specifically growth and decay models. There are many applications of exponential and logarithmic equations. I've chosen to do this topic with you, uh, but this is not the only topic uh, applicable to exponential equations. I like growth and decay models because uh, they're very scientific. Um, they're not like business oriented. It's more of a science-based application and it's particularly timely right now with all of the COVID-19 uh, projections for its growth in the population. So the first thing you have to know in order to do a growth or decay model is you have to know the basic function. So our function calls that function A. So the name of the function is A. It is a function of the variable T, which represents time. So the reason they use A is because that represents an amount of whatever substance or you know, thing, person, whatever is, is present at time T. So what is that function equal to? It is equal to A naught times E raised to the KT power. A naught represents the initial amount present So in other words, when time is zero, then the initial amount present is whatever this number is in the front of the function. E is, remember, just the natural base. It's like the number 2.7. It's the irrational decimal that goes on forever. K here is our growth rate or decay rate. It's the growth or decay rate. And then T is our variable. It's like X. Um, and it represents time. And time here can be measured in minutes, seconds, hours, days, years, whatever unit you need it to. So what does this function look like? Well, in chapter six, we've learned about exponential functions and that they either are increasing or decreasing. So we have two situations. So this is what the function is gonna look like. Um, now remember here our base is E, right? Which is a number bigger than one. And so the function you think is gonna look like this no matter what. However, K here is gonna serve as either a, uh, as a reflection factor. Um, over the y-axis. So what's gonna happen is when k is negative, your exponential function with the base of e is gonna be a decreasing function. So the difference between these is if k is positive, it's a growing function, and if k is negative, it's a decreasing function. So that means that when k is negative, we're talking about decay, and when K is positive, we're talking about growth. How steeply those rise or fall just depends on how big K is. It is worth noting that the X axis here represents time, right? Because remember it's our, our T axis actually. And then the Y axis uh, represents quantity or amount present, right? So with the growth function, the further time goes, and you know, the further time gets, the more of the substance we have. It's getting higher, the amount is getting higher. But as time goes on for the decay function, the substance is becoming less and less and less and less as time goes on. In this example, we'll look at a growth model. A certain bacteria grows at a rate of 0 0.01 organisms per hour. Assume bacteria numbering 1,000 are present now. Our first task will be to find the function that models the, the bacteria's growth. So we know this function is an exponential uninhibited growth function. So that means that the format 
is going to have to take on this form. And time in this problem represents hours. All we need to do is be able to identify where the initial value is, so that's this 1,000, and what our growth rate is, k, so that's this 0 0.01. So the answer to part a is that our function is a of t equals 1,000 raised to the 0 0.01 times t power. That's our exponential growth function. For part B, it asks us how many bacteria there will be after four hours. So when time is four, what is the amount? So in other words, we're looking for A of four. So that's 1,000 to the 0 0.01 times four for T. When we plug that into a calculator, we get out 1,040.81, and the units on that are bacteria. That's how many there are after four hours. So if we started with 1,000 bacteria, in four hours we grow to 1,041, almost 1,042. So it took about four hours to grow 42 bacteria. In question C, we have a slightly different type of question. Instead of how many, it's asking when will, when will there be 5,000 bacteria present? So what we're given in this problem actually is the output. So we'll have 5,000 equal to the function. And we want to solve this equation for T. So when the output when the amount after t hours is 5,000, how, what is that t value? So to solve for t, the first thing we'll do is we'll ex isolate the exponential by dividing both sides of the equation by 1,000. So 5,000 divided by 1,000 is five. And now we want to get t down out of the exponent so we'll go ahead and use the technique where we take the logarithm of both sides of the equation. So we'll have the natural log of 5 is equal to the natural log of e to the 0 0.01t. And what we know is that when we take the natural log of e, or of any, you know, if this base matches this base, so since the base of natural log is e and this base is e, what we know is that then this becomes our, our output. And the reason that works is because this, this exponent can be a multiplier in the front here. Let me go ahead and write it like that. So we have the natural log of 5 is equal to 0 0.01, the exponent, multiplied by the natural log of e. But the natural log of e, because those bases match, is just 1. So what I have is the natural log of 5 is equal to 0 0.01t. And now I can solve for t by dividing both sides by 0 0.01. So t equals the natural log of 5 divided by 0 0.01. Now I recommend you leave that um, for future like reference. If you had another problem, leave that as that number. But because this is kind of the end of the problem, we can go ahead and plug it into our calculator to get the decimal approximation. Right, this is my exact answer, but the decimal approximation is 160.94. So again, if you, if you needed to use this to keep going in the problem to answer something else, leave it as this exact answer. But this is our decimal approximation, which kind of answers our question here, when will, so this is measured in hours. 160, almost 161 hours it'll take for the bacteria to get to 5,000. The last question is actually really similar to question C. So when, we, when will the bacteria triple? So instead of asking when will it be 5,000, I'm actually asking when will it be 3,000? Um, and so what I want to show you about this one is actually if your function is just any arbitrary amount to begin with, a naught, right? In our example, that was uh, 1,000. But let's just say that you know it's any arbitrary initial amount. What does that amount look like tripled? Well, three times a naught. 
So in our example, this is going to be 3,000. That is the tripled amount of my 1,000. But the point I'm trying to make here is we don't actually even need this initial, initial amount to solve the problem because now when we go ahead and divide both sides by 1,000, what you see is you're just left with three on the other side of the equation, right? And you could have seen that from this step up here as well. If you divide both sides by a naught, a naughts cancel out, right? And you're just left with this three on the left-hand side of the equation. Now, the other reason that this one is, this is similar to the previous problem is now to solve, we're gonna go ahead and take the natural log of both sides of the equation, right? The remainder of the solving process here is just like the previous example. So we'll take the natural log of three is equal to the natural log of e to the 0 0.01 uh, t, can't fit my T there. And then what we know is that this exponent gets brought down and the natural log of E cancels out. And so when we solve for T, we get point, we get the natural log of three on top divided by 0 0.01, which if we plug that into our calculator, we can get a decimal approximation of 109.9 hours. So that's how long it'll take to triple. In this example, we're given that the half-life of a radioactive material, radioactive potassium, is 1.3 billion years. If 10 grams are present now, how much will be present in a million years? This is an example of a decay problem. And so instead of guiding us through kind of step by step like we did in the last problem, um, we're kind of, it's open-ended. We have to decide what to do. Well, we have some information about years and quantities. The half-life means that the material will decay by half in 1.3 billion years. So if we have 10 grams present now, it's gonna decay to five grams after 1.3 billion years have passed. So if we only give it a, a million years to decay, we suspect that not very much of this material is going to go away because what, a million years out of 1.3 billion years is a small amount. So our first step is to go ahead and determine what the function is that models this information. So we know that this material follows the uninhibited decay law. So A of T, is equal to a naught e to the kt is our function. So we know that the initial amount here doesn't actually even matter. We just know that half of that initial amount will be the amount present when I plug in 1.3 billion years. So when time is 1.3 billion, the initial amount will be half of what it was, right? This is the initial amount and we're saying that half of that initial amount is present. So then if we divide both sides of this equation by a naught, it'll go away and we'll just be left with one half is equal to e to the k times 1.3 billion. So that's 1 billion 300 million is really the number that goes here. Now we'll go ahead and solve this equation by taking the natural log of both sides of the equation. What that'll do for us is it will bring down our exponent of k times 1.3 billion, and we'll have the natural log of 1 half is equal to k times that huge number. And then now if we solve for k, we'll divide both sides by 1.3 billion. So we'll have the natural log of 1 half over 1 million, 1 billion, 300 million. So that's our k value. Again, you could go ahead and find the decimal approximation here, but I recommend just leaving it as this fraction because it's an exact answer. Now to answer the question, how much will be present in a million years? we're looking for an A value when T is a million. So we're looking for A of a million. So we know the initial amount present is 10, 
and then we have e to the k. We just solved for k. That was the natural log of one half over one billion three hundred million, and then times t. T in this problem is one million. So if we plug that into our calculator, I mean, we could we could go ahead and cross out a couple sets of zeros here if you wanted to. But when you plug this into your calculator, you end up with 9.99467 grams. So what was our initial hypothesis here? One million years is not very much of 1.3 billion years. So if I only give it a million years to decay, did I really decay that much? No. I started with 10. I barely decayed by a thousandth of a gram in a million years. The other application for exponentials that we're going to discuss today is Newton's law of cooling. And this is also an exponential function. And what it looks like is this. So the name of the function is u, the variable of the function is t, so time is getting plugged into this function. And what u of t represents is a temperature. at time t. So what is the temperature of an object after a certain amount of time has elapsed? I experience this all the time with my coffee in the morning. Eventually it cools down and I have to heat it back up. It cools down to what? Room temperature. So here's the function that will allow us to figure out what that temperature is of my coffee after I let it sit there for 20 minutes or longer. So you see some familiar variables here. Again, first of all, T represents time, hours, minutes, seconds. K here is our cooling rate. U naught, but you can guess what that is. If U is temperature, then U naught is our initial temperature of the object. And then the new variable here is this capital T, and that's the ambient temperature or the room temperature. Right? Your object is only going to cool down so much. Room temperature. So let's go ahead and use Newton's law of cooling to do an example. So the function is u of t, the temperature of an object after time t, is the ambient temperature plus the difference in the initial temperature and the ambient temperature multiplied by e raised to the cooling rate times the variable t. In this problem, we know that uh, my kitchen is 70 degrees and my cup cools at a rate of 0 0.05. So what that really means is that k equals negative 0.05. And the initial temperature of my coffee is 180 degrees Fahrenheit. We want to know what is the temperature of my coffee after 20 minutes has passed. So filling in the information we have for all of these variables, we get 70 plus 180 minus 70 times e to the negative 0.05 t. So there's my function that models the rate that my cup of coffee cools. This would be different if uh, we had a different type of cup. So, you know, maybe for an open cup like this, the cooling rate is negative 0.05. But if you get an insulated cup, you might have a different cooling rate, a slower cooling rate. It is strange to know this number. How would you actually figure out what this number is? Well, you'd have to do a little experiment. You'd have to figure out what the temperature of the coffee is when you first pour it, and then give it a couple minutes and then read the temperature again so that you can take those two measurements ver over time and solve for this value of K. When we have live lecture um, for this material, I will go ahead and do an example where we do that. This is just a more basic example. So when we plug this information uh, into a calculator, right, we're not doing anything to the function here, we're just evaluating it when time is 20. So we'll have 70 plus 180 minus 70 e to the negative 0 0.05 times 20. When we plug that into a calculator, we end up with 110 degrees point 
uh, 47, so 110.47 degrees Fahrenheit. So after 20 minutes, my cup of coffee has cooled almost 70 degrees.